Oh, Lord Jesus, please help me to speak so well of, of you now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That's a great song. What just beautiful, beautiful tune, fantastic lyrics. Oh, have we learned that one? Really? So it wasn't Caroline? Rob, if you're online tonight, I apologize. I really did. <laughs> Because I, I, haven't, I haven't heard that before. I, I, it's just a great song, really great song. Um, I have attended church um, from my earliest days. Um, I grew up, or I was born into uh, a family where my mum and dad were Anglicans. And because of that, I was baptized as, uh, as early as possible. And from almost day one, I was, I was taken to church. And uh, give or take a day here and there, um, I've hardly ever missed worship on a Sunday. Um, and I have to say, uh, for many, for me speaking personally, over the last seven months, um, not being able to worship freely, free of masks, um, being close to people physically, um, I have found that very difficult. I have found it very difficult, and I know that that has been true for many of you as well. Um, thinking particularly of, of, of All Saints Veve, there have been a number of occasions where, where people have come back after months of not worshipping in church, walked into church, and just burst into tears. And, and I, it's coming back has just been deeply emotional for people. Uh, there is something about gathering to worship on a Sunday morning. Uh, the church in the Western world, and I, and I mean that in the Western world, has never faced a moment like this in my lifetime. Um, and what a, what, how bizarre it is, um, to come to church, you have to register. Um, when you arrive, you have to be wearing a face mask. Uh, when you enter, you have to disinfect your hands. When you sit down, you have to keep distant. Uh, it's so bizarre. Uh, but it has provoked uh, many... Uh, to ask a really fundamental question. Uh, and I think it's a question that we, it's right that we ask this and it's right that we wrestle with it. And it's this, what is church? What is church? Uh, and if, if we had time tonight, I would have everybody pause uh, and I, put, I would put you into breakout rooms uh, on Zoom and we would discuss that. What is church? In Colossians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul describes the church using a, a three-word soundbite, a, a pithy phrase. And this is, these are the words that he uses, God's holy people. That's the phrase that he uses to describe church, God's holy people. And what I want us tonight is just to reflect on that little phrase and to take each of those three words and just to dig into each word. Um, and I just warn you now, I'm not going to be doing them in order. Uh, so I'm going to be doing word one, word three, and word two. Uh, just put me down as Irish. I don't like to do things in order. Um, so I want us to think about God's holy people as a way of asking that, answering that question, what is church? Uh, and so here's the first one, God's holy people emphasizing the word God, God's holy people. Paul's telling us that the church, whatever it is, above all, is God's possession. It belongs to him. So this, virtual and physical, belongs to him. Um, the community of St. Peter's, virtual, physical, belongs to him. Um, you may not have thought of it in those terms before, but you, just check your pulse, you belong to him. We belong to him. And expanding on that thought, Paul tells us in, in chapter 1, Colossians 1, 18, that, that just as Jesus is supreme over all creation, that that the, the, I'm going to say this wrong, and Odile's going to have to correct me. The pedono uh, belongs to Jesus. 
that Jesus is supreme over, over all of creation. Um, just as Jesus is supreme over that, Jesus is supreme over the church. Paul tells us that he is the head of the body, the church. The church, if you like, is part of his creation, and he holds it together. The church belongs to Jesus. Um, the book of Revelation, uh, chapters 2 and 3, um, paint a picture of Jesus, um, resplendent in majesty and glory. And, and it has this picture of Jesus walking among his churches. Um, it's an incredible picture, tail end of Revelation 1 into 2 and 3. It's this picture of Jesus in glory walking among his churches. Uh, and what comes next is what we call the seven letters to the seven churches. We've all heard of that in the book of Revelation. Jesus is walking among his, his churches uh, and he's announcing himself to his churches and he's speaking over his churches. So here's how he announces himself. This is, he's, he's speaking to the Ephesian church. Um, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Here's how he announces himself to the church in Smyrna. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Pergamum, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. Thyatira, those, these are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Sardis, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Philadelphia, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the keys of David. And finally, Laodicea, which is really, really close to, to Colossae. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Not a bad announcement. If I walk into a room and I have to announce, my, announce myself, I'll say, hi, I'm Clive. But Jesus doesn't do that. Because he is supreme over his church. Uh, Prince William is second in line to the, the British throne. To his wife, Catherine, he's Will. To his boys, he's Dad. I'm not sure what he is to his brother, but often Prince William introduces himself, even in public, as, hi, I'm Wills. However, here's his proper title. He's your Royal Highness, the Duke of Cambridge, Knight of the Garter, Councillor of State, and Knight of the Thistle. And to me, he's your Royal Highness. Sometimes in our 21st century, is, is we, we love familiarity. Um, I'm never called chaplain. I'm never called vicar or rector. I would not want anybody to call me those things. I want people to call me Clive. It's because I'm a 20th, 20th century, 21st century born, born and bred person. I like familiarity. Uh, and when we think of Jesus, we, we tend to think of Jesus as friend, as brother, as lover, as savior. But it's essential, essential that we do not lose sight of the fact that Jesus is the first and the last. He died and came to life again. He's the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire, whose feet are like burnished bronze, who's holy and true, holds the king of David, uh, keys of David. He is the head of the church. And if we were Pentecostals, we'd be shouting hallelujah and we'd be clapping right now. See, Jesus is the head of the church. He's supreme over the church. And how does that help me think about what is church? How does that help me answer that question, what is church? Well, it, it, I think it does this first. It, a lot, it, it, it reminds us never to underestimate just how precious the church of God is. Don't underestimate 
just how precious this community is to him. Don't underestimate how, how precious the, the church on the hill or, or, or Clorillon or, or the Roman Catholic Church, don't, don't underestimate just how precious these communities are to him. They are precious to him and they are to be precious to, guess who? Us. And let's never forget how great the Lord of the church is. Let's never forget that he is the image of the invisible God. Through him, all things were created, and for him, all things are created. He is before all things, and he holds it all together. The Lord of the church is a great and a mighty God. Let's not forget those things. What we do tonight is no small thing. What we do here at St. Peter's is no insignificant thing. Because Jesus is Lord of this church and it is precious to him. God's holy people. Let's go for the word, word number three, God's holy people. That is the church. What is the church? The church is a community of people. The church is a community of people. Um, I don't know whether I have the power to do this. Um, I hope I'm not going to. There we go. Can you all see one another? Yeah. Could you all give each other a wave? Could we just say, yeah, there we go. So the church is a community of people. See, that's much better view there than just looking at me. Uh, the church is, is a community of people. Um, I mean, we could say so much about that. We could talk about church as family. We could talk about church as people sharing lives, serving one another, loving one another, caring for one another. But when ta Paul talks about church as community in Colossians chapter 1, his emphasis is on um, who the people are, the makeup of the community. I'm just going to hold this, this view right now because I might come back to it. Um, when Paul was talking about community in writing to, to the Colossian church, he was talking about two people, well, more than two people, but particularly two people such as Philemon and Onesimus, two members of the Colossian church. Uh, one was a, a landowner. Philemon was a landowner, and he was an owner of slaves. And the other was Onesimus. And Onesimus was one of Philemon's slaves. Uh, in the ancient world, it's very hard to imagine two different people, a slave owner and a slave. And yet there they were, part of the same community. Can you imagine communion on a Sunday at the church in Colossae? And, 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 and the minister stands up and says, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And everybody replies, and also with you. And then the minister says, let's share a sign of peace. And everybody gets out of their pew because there's no COVID in those days. And they go around and they embrace one another as family. And out of the corner of your eye, there you see Philemon and Onesimus, slave owner and slave. And you watch as they walk towards each other. And you turn and you see them embrace one another, slave and slave owner. You see, to, to describe the church as God's holy people is a radical statement, and we must not lose the radical nature of that statement. You see, both Philemon, the slave owner, and Onesimus, the slave, had heard the gospel. And in hearing the gospel, they had encountered Jesus. And, and both of them, to use the old beautiful language, had been wonderfully saved. A miracle had taken place deep inside both of them. And, and that, it meant that, that, that Philemon, when he saw Onesimus, he saw Onesimus in a radically different way. He no longer saw him as a slave. 
but as a fellow man equal in every way but more so not just as an equal in every way human being but as a brother a fellow member of Christ's family and for Onesimus the slave to see Philemon the slave owner Onesimus who would have been captured who would have been placed in the market and sold and bought by Philemon for, for Onesimus to look at Philemon, can you imagine what that must have meant? There must have been such a work of, of forgiveness that had gone on in Onesimus' life for him to look at Philemon as his brother. But you see, that's what Jesus does. That's what encountering Jesus means in a church family. This miracle takes place. And all of us who come from such different places, nations, different cultural backgrounds, maybe on different ends of the wealth spectrum, yet when we gather, we gather as family, equals because of Jesus. And as you look around Zoom tonight, um, we are so different. But yet what gathers us as a community is what Jesus has done for us. I remember one evening, it was the first time we ever had a family small group at, uh, at All Saints. And we'd gather four families together. And, uh, and there was an, uh, an older couple who, was, um, who were running this uh, called John and Meryl McEwen. And, th and they were talking about church as family. And John, who was in his late 60s, turned to my 12-year-old son at the time, Jacob. And John said to Jacob, Jacob, do you know you and I are brothers. And Jacob's 12-year-old eyes just lit up. And he said, really? You see, age is torn down. Racial background is torn down. Wealth is torn down. All barriers are torn down. There's a, a beautiful little bit of history, I think, from the first century that the first bishop, or maybe it was the second bishop of Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, sorry, the second bishop in the church of Ephesus was one Onesimus, the former slave. What an amazing thought. God's holy people What is the church? It's God's possession. What is the church? It's God's community. And finally, what is the church? It's God's holy people. Uh, that word carries with it this idea of being set apart. Holy, the word holy means to be set apart for a specific purpose. Um, uh, it carries with it this idea of being set apart to be pure, morally holy. Uh, and these two ideas are, are held together in this description of the church as God's holy people, set apart for a purpose, committed to and, and moving towards becoming more and more like Jesus in every way. Um, later on in chapter one, um, Paul will, will pray, or earlier on in chapter one, one Paul will pray that, that each believer uh, may live a life worthy of the Lord, this is verse 10, and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work. That's holiness. And then in verse 28, Paul says that he's committed to seeing every believer mature in Christ. You see, it's a, this is a picture of a community spurring one another on so that our mutual desires our priorities, our words, our behavior, all would become aligned with that of Jesus. That my life, your life, would become aligned with that of Jesus. Earlier on, I took you back to Revelation, or took you forward to Revelation 2 and 3. As Jesus, the Lord of the church, one walks among his churches. And if you're familiar with the seven letters,
letters to the seven churches, you'll know that, that Jesus doesn't mince his words, calling his church to the highest standards in belief, in faith, in doctrine, and in behavior. Uh, why does Jesus do that? Why does Jesus, the Lord of the church, challenge his church, setting these high barriers of faith and, and doctrine and behavior? Well, it, here, here is how the church, or how, how uh, the, the answer lies in this, that Jesus speaks to his church. He, he disciplines and he shapes his church. He calls his church to holiness so that when the church itself speaks to the world, its voice will not be drowned out, drowned out by its hypocrisy. It won't be drowned out by self-contradiction. That our message will not be undermined by our life. So that when you go to work tomorrow or when you, you rub shoulders with your, your, your neighbor tomorrow or you pray, play bridge with your, your, friend, your friends next, or next week or or whatever that might be, and, and somebody says to you, so what were you doing on a Sunday, on Sunday evening? And you say, I was worshiping at St. Peter's. The reaction will not be Christians, I can't be having them, but the reaction would be, ah, St. Peter's, I've heard about them. They're quite a remarkable community. Jesus calls us to holiness so that when we speak, our message, our lifestyle doesn't undermine our message. So here we are in these bizarre days. And yet, we're being invited again, I believe, to ask this question, what is church? And Paul's answer, it's part of his answer, is God's holy people. And you'll notice that there's been no mention of Anglican and no mention of buildings. And I'm really surprised, but there's no mention of clergy. I don't know why. God's holy people. Anybody up for that? Let's pray.